Hey everybody, I'm back on YouTube. So for those of you who didn't know, I was living in China for like five months. Most of you know because I think a lot of you are from my Instagram and I was posting about it like every day. And it was an amazing experience. And I thought coming back to YouTube, I would use it as an opportunity to um, answer some questions that you guys had about my experience in China. So I asked on Instagram and you guys responded. I have my Baymax cup here that I like very much. And um, it has some questions in here that you guys asked me. So I'm gonna go through these, see how many I can do and get through um, without making this video too long. So here's my China experience explained. First question. Do you feel more open-minded now? Did you break any paradigm or prejudices? Paradigm? Paradigm? What is that word? Paradigm. Um, I don't think I had any like prejudices before. I have always been like a really big fan of Chinese culture in general. So I can't really say that I had like prejudices. I think it's a little like intimidating moving to a different country, like generally, it doesn't matter what country it is. You don't know what it's gonna be like. I was definitely closed off to certain things. Um, like at first it was really hard for me to even try to use the language. For the most part, I came with a really open heart and a really open mind. I went fully ready to be um, immersed in this culture and um, that's kind of always how I travel. So not really, but uh, good question. Next question. How do you feel about visiting a country with limited speech rights? Um, I'm really glad that I was able to uh, answer this question now and not in China. There is a certain amount of um, limited speech rights in China for sure. If you guys don't know about WeChat, WeChat is kind of the app they use there for everything. They use that app for chatting, they use it for payment, um, they use it for booking tickets to places, uh, food delivery, I, I may have said that. They use it for everything. And there's actually a story of this one Chinese um, young lady who kind of said some offensive things to the leader of China in one of the texts in WeChat and it is very regulated there. And I think she got like arrested for it. So yeah, there are definitely some um, intense speech rights. There's also cameras on you wherever you go in Shanghai. Um, that is a city where I lived, by the way. There is cameras everywhere. Everywhere you walk, basically from the minute you leave your apartment, there are cameras on the street. So you are always being watched. And although that may be a little scary and a little like big brother kind of, it also kept things incredibly safe. I have never felt safer in my entire life than in that city. No one is concerned for their safety really because they don't have to be. Um, it is an incredibly safe city. But that being said, and I know I'm kind of sidetracking, but I think that my point is there are going to be things that suck about living in China. This is what I found out. There's gonna be things that suck and there's also gonna be a lot of benefits. And those things are often hand in hand, just like with America. There's a lot of benefits to capitalism and then there's a lot of drawbacks. There's a lot of benefits with being an extremely protected country. And then there's a lot of drawbacks that come with that. I personally never had to worry about that much. And in Shanghai, it's a little bit different because it's more modern. Um, but there are definitely like party members, like communist party members um, all around. And it is highly encouraged that you do keep your mouth shut about political things when you're there. That being said, they're also a little bit harsher on their own people than they are to tourists. So like, even if I were to say something, sure, it's not encouraged, but like as an expat, as a tourist, um, as a visitor there, um, it is, it, they're kind of like, whatever, like you don't really matter that much. Next question. How did it feel to be one Occidental guy rounded with lots of Asians? Yeah, um, you know what? It felt a little bit weird at first for sure, uh, but then I kind of realized the way that China works and the way that their culture is. And um, for the most part, they just don't care. Nobody cares about you. And I found out this very, very quickly um, just walking in the street in China. The people's vibe there is like very actually similar to California in the way that it's like, people are kind of like, hanging out, you know, doing their thing, going to work, going to a restaurant, going to cafes, doing whatever. Um, but they're doing their own thing and they don't really concern themselves about you. The difference I found between Chinese culture and American culture is um, while both places don't really give a fuck about other people, um, in Chinese culture, they also don't bother to like even acknowledge your existence. You know what I mean? Like when I walk down the streets in California, sometimes I'll see someone I'll be like, hey, what's up? People in China don't do that. They just just go like dead to their own place. Like they are focused on their own thing. They don't concern themselves with people around them. They don't care about what's going on around them at all. And I think like a big thing was I expected more of like people to be like, oh my God, you're an expat here. This is crazy. You're a white dude walking down the street. And like, it wasn't like that at all. Like they were just very, like they didn't care. The little kids sometimes will get you. Like if little kids see you on the subway and they'll look up and be like, oh my gosh, like why go around? Like <laughs> a foreigner, you know? So it is kind of like different for them, but like most Chinese people just, they just don't care. Next question. 
What was the one most shocking thing that you weren't expecting about China? I got this question so much about culture shock, about being shocked, about like when I got there it was like shocking. Like what was shocking? Like I wasn't shocked. Here's the thing. I had a friend who got me that job, right? And he's been there for seven years. So I was really lucky to have someone there who was already experienced in this country and they already knew the things to tell me about what I should expect. I think that the expectation that people have for people going to China is like, oh, you're gonna be so shocked by the culture there because they don't know about what the culture is like there. And they didn't realize how similar it was. Some of the most shocking things for me was like, oh wow, I can get an entire meal for like $2, like American dollars. Like the food being so cheap, things being so convenient, food delivery being so convenient, transportation being so convenient, um, everything through WeChat being so convenient, like everything being run so efficiently. That is probably the thing that I found most shocking. It wasn't anything negative as much as it was like, oh shit, you guys have your shit on lock. I still think that Shanghai is the best city in the world at being a city. Maybe I'll explain a little bit more about what I mean by that, but you really just have to experience it. It's always changing, it's super efficient. They know exactly how to make that city run perfectly um, all the time. And, and I've never seen anything like it. What else we got? What was your go-to food while you lived there? So the thing with China is food delivery is so inexpensive. It is so cheap. The delivery fee you'll pay is like maybe like two or three kwai, which is like 50 cents. So it's nothing to get delivery. You don't tip, culturally you don't tip, and the food is already very inexpensive. So honestly, my go-to was just ordering delivery pretty much almost every night. The only thing that was tricky about that was I had to pick up some phrases to be like, hey, how do I answer a phone? Way. And then, you know, how do I tell them I'm coming? Lila, which is, I'm coming. So like, there's very small things that I had to learn um, in order to make it work, but that's basically it. And other than that, it was so convenient. You just punch in your address. The only problem was that the app was all in Chinese. So I did have to like screenshot it and then like transfer it over to a translation app and then like figure out what I was ordering exactly. But there's pictures on everything, which is nice. But yeah, I'd say my go-to is just like, anything I could get from delivery and they have a lot of options. Like I said, it's very similar to the States where it's just like, you have healthy food, you have Indian food, you have Chinese food, you have McDonald's, you have fast food. Like you get pizza, like anything you want is, is on that app. So it was easy for me to order exactly what I wanted. I found a nice lean like protein thing would be that they have like kebabs there that they serve. Like their barbecue is kind of just like kebabs. So I get that a lot um, when I was looking for something lean to eat. And then like, of course, like mala shango, which I'll tell you guys about later, maybe but it was amazing. Anyway, more questions. <laughs> How are dating apps there? I always wonder. Without going into much detail, um, the dating apps were lit. I had a lot of luck in China, much more than here. And that's all I gotta say. What do you miss most and what have you enjoyed the most? Oh man, I ordered, I tried to, and I'm kind of going off the food app thing, I tried to order a sandwich here uh, delivered to me and the delivery and tax and everything all together like the sandwich was $12 and the delivery and everything was $18 It was a $30 sandwich to get delivered. I'm gonna miss being so, being so convenient to have food um, At my fingertips and basically like paying dimes for it gonna miss that a lot I think that like the convenience of China was a huge thing that I'm going to miss the other thing I'm gonna miss also which kind of ties is the fact that you have the entire world at your doorstep I was able to travel to Bali to Japan to Beijing to Thailand to so many places just because I was right there and it was so convenient flights were six hours max and you could go oh, so many places in Asia and it's just way more convenient than being in the United States where the closest things are Canada and Mexico and that's like all you you got the South America too but like you know what I mean like it was just so much more convenient to be so close to so many countries that I've always wanted to visit um, and I'm gonna miss that a lot I think that covers that question let's go with that what's normal there but probably wouldn't be uh, okay here what's normal there oh man okay so like cutting in line this is a big thing is like a lot of people are like oh my gosh like Chinese people are always so close to you in line they have like no spatial Okay, like, yes, the spatial awareness is very different there, but the philosophy is basically like, if you are standing far back in line, so far back that there's a huge gap in front of you and someone can skip you, you can be skipped. And the thing is, yes, that's kind of a culture shock, but like, once you realize that, and once you realize that as the rule, then you can function inside of this set of rules. And so that's what I did. I'm like, damn, it's funny. Cause like the first time someone skipped me in line when I was in China, I was like, oh, okay. 
I guess that's what the Chinese do. And then I started skipping people in line when I was in China. And I was like, damn, man, I'm just Chinese. Like, <laughs> like <laughs> I would say that. And the other thing is like people cough and hack and like have these terrible noises on the street. And I'm so glad I'm not going to hear every single fucking day anymore. Cause I am so sick of that noise. Next question. Any tips for traveling solo? Do it, do it, do it, do it. Everybody needs to travel solo. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're in a relationship or if you have kids and a family, like just travel alone. At some point, do it. It was so, I can't even, ah, it was just amazing. Like going at your own pace, being able to do your own thing, the feeling you get, uh, the sense of accomplishment for, for being able to take care of yourself, to, to do your own thing, just an amazing feeling. It was such a great, a great thing. And, and do I have any tips? Um, keep your mind open. Always say yes to new opportunities. Do as much as you can. Trust your instincts. Just enjoy it, man. Like you're, there's so many cool things about traveling alone. Not only do you get to enjoy all these new experiences, but also you see yourself getting better at doing it. And that is it's really rewarding. And it's just such a great experience. Um, highly recommend traveling alone. Everyone should go for it. How long did it take you to learn basic Chinese in order to communicate and get around? Okay, great question. I really like this question because it's very important. How do you communicate in a, in a, in a language um, that you're not familiar with? In China, I think there's a misconception that a lot of people in China speak English. True, a lot of people in China learn English in school. Do they want to speak English? It's like if I asked you right now, did you learn Spanish in school? Yeah, okay, talk Spanish to me. You'd probably be like, ah, no, 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 I don't do that. That's kind of the same way they are, right? They don't want to speak English if they don't have to. So it is important to pick up some Chinese. The question is how long, I know I get sidetracked. Two to three months, I was able to do like basic enough stuff where I felt able to communicate in a way that would be helpful. I'd say about four to five months was when I felt like I was picking up phrases, like I was hearing things and I was like, okay, I know what's going on now. And like, I am able to communicate back and I am comfortable enough. Like, you know, by the end I was ordering my coffee fully in Chinese. Like I was able to do things like that. I was starting to use different phrases. I was starting to use more phrases. You know, when I was going to the grocery store, I'd be like, uh, like you know, I'll take a bag. Like when I was in a, a DD, which is like their Uber, basically their, their transportation app, you know, I could, I could be like, woman dala, like we're here now. I started to pick it up a little bit more towards the end. I would say like four to five months was exactly when I was starting to pick up that language to a point where I felt good. Two to three was like basic enough where I was like, okay, I feel comfortable now communicating. So it kind of varies. And I wish, I honestly think if I would have stayed there any longer, I would have started taking lessons to get like really good at it because at a certain point, it's just, it's just like, if you're going to live there, it makes it so much more convenient to know the language, obviously. So what else we got? What food slash dish are you going to miss the most from Shanghai? Mala Shango. So it's this, it's, I think it literally translates to like aromatic spicy pot or something like that. It's kind of like, um, you get to pick what you put inside of it. Just like some meats and some like noodles and vegetables and you put it all together and they put it in this spicy kind of like, it's not even like a sauce, it's not thick or anything, it just kind of tastes like spicy. It's spices, it's spices. And then they have Sichuan peppers in there too. If you guys don't have Sichuan peppers, and I don't see them a lot in the United States, and I never had them until I went to China, but basically they're these small peppercorns that are like circular, just like a normal peppercorn, but you eat it and it numbs your mouth. It gives you this numbing sensation, and it's like if you've had um, Mapo tofu, which it's never right here. <laughs> Every time I've had it in the States, it's not been right, but Mapo tofu, when you go to China and have it, they have Sichuan peppers in it too, and it's like, it's spicy and it numbs your mouth. It's a really cool sensation. It's a very awesome experience, and I'm really gonna miss that because they don't really have it here. But yeah, definitely that was like my go-to when I wanted to eat a lot of food. I was just like, oh, I'm gonna get a Mala Shango tonight and like, just go at it. So good, it's making me hungry. Have your mannerisms changed? Yes, they have. I noticed um, a couple months into China that my mannerisms definitely changed. I started using chopsticks instead of forks. I preferred them. I started preferring using chopsticks, probably because also the food there is more, um, like it's easier to eat with chopsticks. Not because it's all Chinese food, but because the thing is like in Chinese dishes, they'll cut the meats. So there's no point to use a fork and knife because you don't need to cut anything. But especially now like salads, I find. Salads with chopsticks are like a lot easier for me to eat. So I prefer that. Another thing I noticed myself doing is that like in China, they don't have a straight up word for yes or no. Um, and in fact, a lot of the time for an af like for affirmation, people will just grunt. And I started noticing that I was doing that too. So someone will ask me something or like, they'll say something and be like, hmm, hmm. Like that's just my go-to now. Like they'll just be like, hmm, 
Like, and that's, that's an acceptable answer. And actually another expat told me that he's like, if you ever are having a conversation with a Chinese person and you want to sound like you actually know what they're saying, just grunt at the end of their sentences. And I, I started doing it. It's like true. If you just go, Hmm, they'll be like, Oh, okay. Yeah. He understood that. It's so funny, but that's like the common way to say yes. Basically it's just, Hmm. What are a few things you wish everyone could stop getting wrong about China? Great question, and I know who wrote this. I will say that there is this huge misconception about communism, and I don't want to make this too political or be weird about it, but I will say that people who have never experienced a communist country or don't know what that actually is probably should do some research um, or visit one of these countries because it is not what you think it is. And I hear this all the time, is just people going like, oh, well, who would want to live in a communist country? Well, who would want to live in a communist country? Who would want to live in a communist country? And it's like, dude, You've never even been to a communist country. Like you have no idea what it's like there. And I feel like there's this misconception about people being like, oh, well the doctors get paid the same as the trash guys. And like, that's actually not true at all. It is, it, I was honestly very surprised to find that the way that China works is a lot more capitalist than you guys would think. It is incredibly similar to what we have here. And the communist party is more of an actual party that is running the country than it is a uh, economic structure that they have. I won't get too far into it. I just encourage you guys to do your own research and to um, reconsider when you're thinking like, oh, well, that's our communist country because you probably have no idea what you're talking about. <sighs> okay, well, I think that's a good place to stop. We got a lot of questions in there. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. I'm going to be doing another video pretty soon of, um, I took uh, videos of actually when I went to Shanghai Disney. So I'm going to be able to show you guys exactly what that's like for those of you who are interested in, in the park. And I have a lot more stuff that I have had just sitting on my computer waiting to be edited um, that I can do now. So um, keep your eyes out. I've got some really fun videos I think that you guys will like soon. Take care.